an openly queer, autistic, trans, disabled actor, advocate, and educator, and I'm working on a thesis educating y'all about creating accessible classrooms, what accessible theater looks like. I'm the director for this project. We are doing the first all neurodivergent cast and crew production of The Curious Incident of The Dog in the Nighttime. It's gonna be super freaking cool, and we're gonna make so much history with this, which is just exciting and baffling and also terrifying. We released our production poster last week, and it kind of blew up in some settings that I released it to, and I got asked to interview for some really, really cool things this spring, and I'm still kind of freaking out about it. You can follow that show on social media. We also have auditions coming up shortly. World's first all neurodivergent cast and crew production of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. The world's first all neurodivergent cast and crew production of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. World's first all neurodivergent cast and crew production of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. World's first all neurodivergent cast and crew production of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. The world's first all neurodivergent cast and crew production of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. The world's first and the world's first. The world's first world's first the world's first um some some things have happened tomorrow is three weeks since the show was canceled there's no clear answer as to how to even begin to tell this story honestly we went back and forth for months as to whether we would actually follow through and tell the rest of it it's so easy to point fingers and blame people for how all of this went down but the thing is there's no particular hero or villain here this is a story of what institutionalized ableism looks like, what happens when the arts are underfunded, what happens when expectations are set but without a willingness to actually do the work to follow through. And it's not exclusive to our college or our theater department. We just happen to have a camera on to document it in real time. This is a story of the importance of accessible spaces and how to make them, the power of minority community and of a group of young people who believed in the possibility of a better world and tried to build it within a system where all the odds were against them. Though it may sometimes feel like a story of loss, underneath that is one of hope, strength, and the adventure of a lifetime. A uh, purposefully all neurodivergent cast and crew production of something is fairly, as far as we can tell from research, never been done before. I don't know if that's, it, maybe it has. I think it, it definitely has, but not everybody knew they're neurodivergent, you know? But anyway, so because this has never really been done before, specifically, uh, there's not a lot of, resources on how to make accessible theater education for higher ed. Typically accessible theater education resources you see are for middle school and elementary school. We're trying to make a sort of guidebook, I guess, on how we did it and what we learned and what we still have questions about. It's gonna be messy, we've acknowledged that and that's gonna be perfect. We're calling it a safe space because that's just what in our brains we think of, right? But when you think of safe space, we often think of something that is super cushiony and that you know, you can't push boundaries in a safe space. And so we're creating what's a liberated space in the uh, discussions of educational reform. It's called a liberated space, um, which basically it means that it is a safe space in the sense that you can talk about anything with guidelines and everybody is going to feel comfortable. And when you talk about uncomfortable topics, you do it tastefully with trigger warnings, with understandings of why you're talking about that. This is real. This is actually happening. We are actually doing this and uh, everybody's thinking so big and imagining the most perfect, beautiful, amazing show. And as a director, that is terrifying because I don't know how we're gonna be able to do it, but I know that we are. And I, I don't even have a mental image of how cool it's gonna be, but I know that it's gonna be really cool and that I trust this team with my life. Um, and yeah, so anyway, we are all off to winter break from now. We're really excited to hit the ground running in uh, end of January, early February. And uh, we got we got quite the show for you. And I'm really excited about it. So, yeah. How we can give it some elegance in its movement so it has some sort of personality in how it's being moved around the space which sounds weird and scary when you say it out loud, but then it makes sense when you do it. Grab part of the table, you can lift it up from the bottom, yeah, however you want to move it. And you can also shift hands as it moves as well. And make sure not to impale anybody. You also may notice that we've had a lot of personnel changes um, because the new semester happened and everybody went, oh, my schedule is different than I thought. And we had to uh, move a lot of roles around and we had to add a bunch of people to the project, which is wonderful and I'm so happy to have them. And we miss the people that we don't have anymore, but um, it's definitely been a learning curve this semester. You're too old to be a policeman. Christopher? Hit the deck. <laughs> Ronaldo. Pull a Neymar Jr. Let's go. Train coming. Train stop. Doors open. Train going. Silence. 
right now we are in a space in the psychology building. And also he bangs his chin and screams a lot. Do I we, know how he feels. Do we want to have another <laughs> ensemble member try to pretend that there is something? After spring break, we are going to be moving to Art 222, which is the room that we had first semester, which is a dance studio, and we're gonna have all of our props and like the blocks that we need and the tables and chairs that we need for the show to work with while we're in that space. We're gonna be there for two weeks, and then we move to the main stage theater where we're gonna start tech rehearsals. And go to one foot. Good. Your mother, before she died, was very good friends with Mr. Shapes. Ace, what are you doing? This is a video. We are. Hanging up posters. Hanging okay, up posters. Not holding up. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. <laughs> Not like that. Like slide them on the floor. Oh. Like as soon as so you want to. I wanted to, to zoom into my hands. I think Mr. Shears probably killed Wellington. I will not have that man's name mentioned in my home. Okay. For one second. <laughs> hey. <laughs> You're Canadian. Right? I am Canadian. Sydney, what are we doing? Watching a bad movie. And what are we doing while we're doing oh. that? <laughs> For the record, we're watching me before you and it's bad. Um, I am addressing 43 letters and I'm learning to dot my eyes with circles because it tells me to do that in the script. Because the script is, oh, so this is this. The yeah. script is one of the most hyper specific scripts I've ever looked at. And it's as somebody tried to find props, infuriating. What sort of disability <laughs> representation Oh, also for an update of the letters, I have written all of the addresses on all 43. We have both, and I'm putting stamps on them, and then we're gonna stamp on top of the stamps that they've been sent, because we're doing a good job with props. What kind of movie was that? It's so bad. That was, stay tuned for my review in April, guys. Because. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm doing my best, okay? I don't know why I'm sitting like it's also like 11 mode. p.m. I don't know what's happening anymore. Oh no, that was too big. Oh, down here. I'm making my sixth grade science project. And we had to do maths to figure this out too. It was terrible. So much maths. <laughs> <laughs> I'm losing my mind. It has been like six hours since we started. 451C Chapter Road, London, MW2, 5NG. He's too much old. Also Hamiltoning though. Yes, but Phoenix Town is much closer to our house. That's our pile over there.
Sydney, y'all know me, my pronouns are they them. I am the director of this production, I'm also playing Christopher. I am Grace or Ace McIntyre and I use they, them, and all pronouns, and I am the co-director, costumer, cinematographer, props person, <laughs> a, bit, a bit of everything. The national tour of this production was truly one of the coolest design shows I've ever seen, but the most inaccessible show I've ever seen, um, because they showed the inside of, of Christopher's brain um, as like how big and loud and overwhelming the world is to an autistic person, by doing it entirely with strobe lights, with moving lights, with super loud sound design, um, super overwhelming, so much going on. And I was sick for just like a full week afterwards with a really, really bad migraine because of the experience of seeing that show, because of how inaccessible it was. When I was a first year in college, I finally got my autism diagnosis, which is really exciting. Um, and a local place was also doing The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, and so I went to see it with this new lens of, oh, I'm autistic and I want to see this production. Um, and Again, it was more accessibly staged than the production I had seen in the national tour, but it still had a lot of moving lights and it still had a lot of really loud sounds. And I still felt like this character of Christopher was not actually authentically me on stage, but rather somebody looking at me through a magnifying glass and then trying to put that on stage. And the person I was with was like, why don't you just direct it? Why don't you just make your own? And I was like, that's such a great idea. And so I proposed this project to the department as I'm gonna do this for my thesis when I'm a senior, like first semester of my first year at this school. Um, and it has been slowly just like in the back of my mind always as a possibility. And even from the beginning, I was like, am I just gonna direct it and make it happen? Or am I gonna direct it and play Christopher? I'm not sure because as much as directing is fun and interesting and cool, I don't like it. Um, <laughs> I've never quite enjoyed directing um, just because like there is so much artistic control that it can get very overwhelming very quickly. And I am more of like an assistant director kind of person. I really like editing work. I really like creating off of something rather than not really having anything to begin with. Um, and so that was definitely a learning curve here. So I ended up deciding um, to, because I want to be an actor and I love acting and that's what I want to do. And I also know like this show, because of how it's structured, the whole thing sits on Christopher's shoulders. And I knew that the project that I was going to do by making it all neurodivergent, we're making world history. But I knew that in making history, there's a lot of pressure. Um, there's a lot of, oh my gosh, we're doing this for the first time and everybody's gonna be watching and oh my gosh, what if I mess up, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I can handle that insane existential crisis. And I don't wanna put that on somebody else. So that was when I ultimately decided to do both at the same time. My team was super open to that and helped talk me through all these reasonings. I will say that in hindsight, I don't know if I would have done this again. Um, in the sense of doing both at the same time because being able to direct and act in your show is very possible, it's very plausible. It's not easy, but it's very definitely both possible and plausible and a lot of small companies do this regularly. Um, but I don't feel like I had the support in place to make that possible and reasonable. To start off, this wasn't the plan. I wasn't originally intended to be the co-director or even the assistant director of Curious Incident of the Dog in the nighttime, but during the production process um, that Cindy has talked about, especially when we had a lot of crew uh, turnover, one thing led to another and I ended up being assistant director and then later co-director of Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. The responsibilities were pretty much the same. The title just shifted mainly to reflect the amount of work that I was doing with the production. When Ace became <laughs> my co-director, we were both like, oh yes, we're gonna pass off props and costumes to someone else. And then we both just kind of looked at each other and we went, no, we're not. We've been thinking about this for months and it's gonna stay the way that it is. And so we put ourselves in a very silly situation in which we have to, <laughs> you're laughing at me. We had to somehow magically uh, direct the show and uh, stage the show and I had to be Christopher. And also we've had to construct all of the props and find and construct all of the costumes, which has been an absolute adventure. We had a lot of people join the project who don't know a lot about acting or don't know a lot about design or don't know a lot about these things, but were ready to learn and figured it out. Just like put in that dedication, put in that energy. Um, one pattern we did notice, and you will also notice this if you go through our older videos, is that we've had a lot of turnover on, on our team. We have a lot of new people that were not here for semester. In having an all disabled show, so like we're all neurodivergent, neurodiversity is a section of disability, so we're all disabled here. Um, and a lot of us are also physically disabled as well. In doing that, we are working with a very specific subsection of the population. 
and we are working with a subsection of the population that is fundamentally let down by the academic system. Again, not trying to like drag this college through the mud. All colleges are like this. This is universal. Um, and everybody's, you know, trying the best that they can. But because of this, we've seen met so many wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people who are just rays of sunshine, who are so excited to create art, who are so excited to join in on this project. And we've had that happen continuously. And then uh, once they start really getting into their classes and they start getting discriminated against by professors or start having to do other things, they have to go into survival mode. And in order to survive survival mode, they end up having to drop all the things that they love. And so we have had so many people be on our team for weeks at a time and leave or even just a couple days and have to leave. And every single time it has been like a sitting down sobbing conversation of, I really, really want to do this, but I just can't and I need to get by and I'm sorry and I'm sad about it and whatever. And that has been really difficult for us as directors to watch all these wonderful people that we enjoy working with, that we love having around, have to quit because they don't have the proper supports available. Um, so like the activism that began this project was how can we make the classroom more accessible for people? And it is kind of morphed into a, wow, the academic system is an experience. It's not just that we want to have props and costumes that are accurate to the script, cohesive for a story, and work with things like color theory, um, what story are we telling and how does color relate to that, but also what is and isn't accessible. And this can be for a wide variety of things. This can be for things like textures because a lot of us, I think almost all of us, have um, texture sensitivities. If you're wearing something that's scratchy, if you're wearing something that's uncomfortable, if you're wearing something that doesn't make you feel good, that's like physically not comfortable, you can't focus and you can't think and your brain goes all fuzzy and then it goes blank, which is not helpful for people on stage. So we had to figure out how can we find costumes that fit this character, that fit this color palette, that fit this body, that are not from the 1970s and gross, um, that also are sensory friendly. How can we find things that are soft, which ended up being a, a very difficult thing to find. I think had we had a big budget like most theater companies do, it wouldn't have been a problem because we could have just purchased things, which is what we did for the uh, jumpsuits that we're using for the ensemble for most of the production. Um, but it was definitely difficult to try to find things and be like, oh, this isn't soft actually, but it looks really good. How do we want to change it? Do we need to hem this? Do we need to take out the tags? How can we make it more comfortable, which has been interesting. There's also the accessibility of we have a lot of trans people in our production just because the trans neurodivergent overlap, like um, planning, okay, how can we cover up binders or do you want your binder showing? How can we, uh, are you gonna wear a packer? Are you not? Um, how can we cover tattoos? And those kinds of things that are also accessibility measures as well. If we found the perfect piece that we think, oh yes, this fits and it is perfect for the character, but it um, affects the actor negatively from a sensory perspective, then it's out, no questions about it. If it's something that we cannot alter any way to fix that problem, then it's out. The other like struggle, I guess, is that if you've never worked costumes before, um, traditionally when you work in a costume closet, your costume closet is going to have approximately zero modern things and approximately 100 million things that are from the 1960s and 70s because most costume closet things are donations that people give to places when they clean out their attic one day. And so <laughs> we're trying to figure out how to make this thing look modern and fit this aesthetic that we want, um, but at the same time, use what we already have because we didn't have a very big budget for this project, um, which is definitely an adventure. We also, Ace and I, one morning, I don't know if we have footage of this, but we went around, our school has free bins in every single dorm where people can just get rid of things they don't want anymore. And we went through every single free bin on the entire campus looking for costumes. And we got like half of our costumes from the free bins. Costuming for Christopher was really, really fun because we decided that we wanted Christopher to have a different outfit for every night. And so we had, we started with this long list of ideas and then we narrowed them down. We combined some and then we fig figured out our favorites and then we ended up with our ideas. We have like a punk butch version of Christopher, which is like a lightened version because he's also 15 years old so we couldn't make it too like aggressively punk butch. Um, but like that one, um, we have a cottage core version where we're like making a star theme corset, which is really cute. Um, we have one that's more in the Gen Z fashion vibes. Um, and then we have uh, another version that's more just like gender bendy, um, like button up shirt and, and pants situation. And so, and we also like are doing uh, one run 
just for ourselves with the like original traditional one just to have just to have that in our souls as well um, but that has been a really interesting process and in how can we find all these costumes how can we make sure that every single costume we pick also all works with the ensemble also all works with everything else that we've picked um, and it's going to be very interesting to step into this role every single night in a completely different outfit because costumes very much create the character in the sense of physicality and the sense of how you move and how you exist. The process of coming up with costumes for this one has been really interesting because it's a modern piece so we could literally just be like hey everybody come do the show in your street clothes but we chose to deliberately not to do that um, because Christopher is very particular about colors. Um, he talks a lot in the show about how he really hates the color yellow and he really hates the color brown and really loves the color red and metal color, which metal color is arguably very much brown and yellow and not a color anyway. But anyway, those are the colors that he likes and the colors that he doesn't like. And so in creating a color palette for this show, we're like, okay, this character does not match with Christopher, so we're gonna have it in those colors that he doesn't like. And we try to figure those things out. While we are seeing Christopher's story play out, we are also seeing Siobhan read the story. We are seeing this being put into a play. So you could think about it in a way that we are also reading this from Christopher's mind, so in places where he is uncomfortable, he might associate um, things that he doesn't like with that. So we, or if Christopher was casting for this, he'd be like, "I this is a scene where I was unhappy, so I'm gonna include things that make me unhappy. For example, yellow and brown. We do this noticeably where Roger gives Christopher a shirt and it is a bright yellow shirt. It is everything Christopher would not want. Roger also has hints of brown in his outfit because he is not something, someone that Christopher feels safe with. Whereas Judy is someone who doesn't wear, um, as opposed to other ensemble members in London where they have hints, of, they sometimes have hints of brown or yellow, Judy does not have any of that. Um, because even though her relationship with Christopher isn't solid, it is still a lot safer than Roger. And this is also something that we reflected in Ed. Ed has hints of brown in his clothing, but it's almost in a way that Ed doesn't notice. We were thinking of it like Ed isn't, Ed is trying, he is, a lot of, everything that comes through for Ed is that he is trying, but he is not executing it well. So he's trying to make his son comfortable. He's trying to wear clothes that would be okay for Christopher, but he's still messing up in some ways. So there are gonna be hints of brown in his outfit that also reflect the attitude that Christopher has towards him, this level of, um, unease. And so if, a, if the audience knows, okay, Christopher doesn't like brown and yellow, and then we see a character come on with brown or yellow, we're automatically going to think this is bad, even if we don't realize it. But the other thing that we had a lot of trouble with <laughs> was props. Um, if you're unfamiliar with Curious Incident, a lot of Christopher's lines talk about talk about things in hyper specific detail like so much specific detail and the point of that like from a literary perspective is to prove that like Christopher as an autistic person sees everything hyper specifically and he absorbs way too much information there's too much going into his brain which is why he's overwhelmed all the time um, but in doing that it means that we're naming very specific books by specific authors it means that we are naming very specific designs of clothing it means we are naming very specific brands and those kinds of things. That meant that we had to source all of those things or make all of those things or find all of those things, which was very difficult. The book that's being referenced, uh, which is The Masqueraders by George at Hyder, is from the 1920s. It took us a long time to get our hands on a copy of that. Um, there's a red and purple striped towel, which is objectively a very unusual and also bad combination of colors for a towel, which is also impossible to find. And so in coming up with props, we were like, oh, how does this fit the personality? How does this fit? How can we make this book feel like Christopher? How can we make this feel like Christopher and feel like the, the vibes of the show? But also there is a disgustingly wild amount of props in this production. And so many of them are specifically already laid, laid out for us, which on one level is nice because then we can just be like, oh yeah, we know that we need this and we don't need to think about the aesthetic, we don't need to think about whatever, but it means that we need to find that hyper specific thing or we need to make it. I will also very much say that for Ace and I, I think it has been the most fun part of this production because we're both nerds and we're into that nitty gritty, like little teeny tiny pieces and those little Easter egg moments. So if you happen to come see the show, you will notice a lot of Easter eggs in our props. For example, there's a certain uh, playbill that uh, Judy and Roger bring back from uh, when they come back from their night out and they run into Christopher. Um, there's also a specific football team that is being repped at some point in our show. Um, so there's a lot of little silly Easter egg things like that that um, I hope that you guys notice and enjoy. And then we also have our set. Two tables, some chairs, a stool, 
and some blocks. Originally, the blocks we had came from the school, but because we needed such a large amount, um, they ended up being not uniform in terms of size and weight and structure. So this meant that some of them were really big, some of them were really small, some of them were light, some of them were heavy. Some of them um, were not supportive enough so that when we stood on them, they caved in a little. And it was not to a degree where an actor would not be safe, but it was enough that this was a issue of mental safety. If an actor is thinking, oh, I am not safe here, this is this feels unsafe, unsafe, even if they know logically that it won't be, it's still gonna affect performance. And this is something that all set designers know. So we made the decision that, okay, we are going to get new blocks and this has to happen. What we ended up doing is that I took on the responsibility to make new blocks. Um, so I did this in conjunction with another class of mine as a kind of final independent project. Hi, um, my name is Leela. I use she, her, they, them pronouns, and I am the stage manager for this production. I got into the project in February um, because a stage manager was needed, um, but I heard about it over the summer. Like I, whenever Sydney started posting about it. Um, from like following their account and had like immediately messaged them about it because I wanted to bring my students to see the production. Um, so we had been in communication about it like randomly th over the course of the first semester. Um, and then they reached out asking if I knew any stage managers. The process entails like trying to figure out people's communication styles and what works best for them and making sure that information is available and accessible in multiple different formats and that it's that everybody knows where those formats are and where those resources are um it's also like every production requires different things of its stage managers and there's like slightly different responsibilities and slightly different dynamic with directors and the rest of the production team. So figuring what that was like in this specific production that has like a lot of choreography that also still has a lot of technical components um, has been like really fun to, to play around with and to see what like my specific slot is within the production team. Sydney and I were determined to make sure that there were clear boundaries between um, us in terms of what we would allow the other to do and when to say no to things and that has been something that is I think very hard for a lot of neurodivergent people is self-advocacy and so right off the bat we had a conversation about um, we need to hold each other accountable. And also if Sydney is delegating something to me and it's something I can't do, I don't have the time to do, or just for whatever reason I decided that I can't do it, I have to communicate that to Sydney. We set up a lot of boundaries for where our friendship is and where our work relationship is and what the difference is and what that means. And this is something that is very important when working with an all neurodivergent cast and crew is we all have different methods of communication. There is something that we've noticed that we are able to communicate on some level a lot better because we do have all similar like brains in some way or another. We still have very different forms of communications. Just because we are all neurodivergent doesn't mean we all suddenly can communicate super easy. That's not how it works. We have communication issues just like neurotypical people have communication issues with each other. But the key differences that we've noticed is that because neurodivergent folks have gone through so much of their life struggling to communicate not on their faults but because neurotypical society will not try to reach out to them and meet them where they are, um, there has been this openness and this welcomeness to have these conversations of how can we set communication, how can we get this done. One of the big things with this production was working with people's, I mean, this is always a thing, but it was like very much a thing with, for this production, working with people's like bodily abilities and what are they able to do comfortably and what are they able to do repeatedly. 
um, throughout the course of rehearsals and a run and making sure that um, whatever movements we choreograph and add into the show aren't actively harming um, anyone, which again is like always a thing for fight choreo, but was something that we have to be very conscious of for the specific production and the specific people that we have in our show. And even like smaller things, like what are the elements that can, or what are the parts of a stage combat scene or just like of bodily reaction to something that can like trigger a response in our actors and what are the ways that we're able to work around that to make sure that we're still keeping the integrity of the scene and keeping what the playwright wants from the scene and their direct like their authorial intent um but also respecting our actors autonomy and like their agency as individuals and keeping those two things in tandem and creating a really good production without having to minimize or like draw back on one of them I'm Maya. I am. I play track two, which includes Roger and. But mainly, Roger's the biggest one. The check ins at the beginning of rehearsals often, like, get me into the space for acting and, like, not necessarily shedding the stuff from beforehand, from, like, before I step into the rehearsal space, but, like, acknowledging it, which oftentimes in previous theater things, like, you leave life outside the door, outside the theater. But here it's like, we acknowledge it, and then we go to the theater. Um, Ariel and I do lights. I put go-go's in, I try to figure out what the fuck is going on with the light grid, um, and uh, translate it into something that is actually readable. And then, hopefully soon, I will press buttons to operate the lights. My ADHD units are really hard for me to, like, process things if they aren't organized in a certain way, so I was able to, like, putting it in the organization that I've made, made it actually possible for me and hopefully other people to actually read it and know what's going on. My name's Betty, Betty Smart, and uh, I made the projections for this. I think the one that came into my head first was the train station when all of the voices are talking and Christopher is just hearing what they all are. I really, I liked that one because they were, because Sydney told me like, make it overwhelming, but don't make it like overstimulating or something like that. And I just immediately knew how to do that. And what I did was with color, I drew a bunch of squares and one side was one color and each color represented a person and then another side was another color, and that represented the type of message, if that was restriction, or advertisement, or warning. Um, and then I connected all the boxes together so it looked like one of those crazy crowded train maps you see all the time. I think the one that was more difficult was the space, because I don't, I usually work very straight lines and everything. Everything is concrete and simple. It's nothing that blends into each other like watercolor. So that was a fun foray into the wilderness for me. How do I, you know, how do we work with an all disabled population and make things accessible in a fundamentally inaccessible space? How are we able to do that? How are we able to work with that? That's been the one challenge that has been really taking up a lot of our time and energy. Again, not because it's not possible or that it's not easy. It's just that if I were directing a theater company, completely, and I had the whole thing myself and I ran it, this would be easy. This would be just the same amount of work and effort and energy as it would be directing any other production. The thing is, is that we are working within a system where we have to ask permission for everything that we do and everything that we're doing is against the norms. And so we've been facing a lot of pushback for that. People are like, oh yeah, we should. We do want to make this accessible. We do want to make this possible. And then you start explaining how, and then people are like, oh, but things have always been this way and we like them this way and this makes us feel comfortable. We don't want to change anything. And that's kind of what we've been struggling with this entire year has been a lot of, okay, we're going to make accessible theater in this space and here's how we're going to change things to be accessible. And here's how we need you as a school, as, uh, as people, et cetera, et cetera. This is how we need to be supported in order to make this possible and easy for us. Um, and we haven't really gotten that support, um, unfortunately. We can change attitudes um, and we can change 
various barriers, whatever, but you can't change the fact that a building, the only dressing rooms are down a flight of stairs, right? Like that's not something that we can fix, but how are we going to change it? Well, we have our dressing rooms, so there's two options. Um, no matter where you want to go in this building, you have to go down or upstairs. So there's one option where you go down seven stairs and that gets you level with the stage and there's some classrooms there and then our dressing rooms are down another flight of stairs. So we're not using those dressing rooms, we're converting a classroom into the dressing rooms. But that's something that you wouldn't need to think about until you start to think about it and you're like, oh, that's not accessible. Um, and so there's been a lot of those things. A lot of those things where we're just like, oh yeah, we know that the school has these things to offer so it's going to be fine, don't worry about it. And then all of a sudden we get to the point where we start using that thing and we're like, whoa, this is not gonna work at all. And we need to backpedal, we need to find a new way around this situation to be inclusive, to be accessible, to be safe for our actors and for our team. And that is not saying by any means that disabled people are not hireable, that we are not able to be worked with, that we make things more difficult, because that is not true at all. But we also like deserve basic safety and we, you know, like spending a lot of extra time to figure out how can I make myself safe in this unsafe situation is not a good use of our actor's time or energy. It's not a good use of my time or energy as a director. It's not a good use of any of this team's time or energy. So we have been trying to figure out, okay, how can we try to make things as accessible and safe as possible? We didn't get final information about what was happening or where we were getting things or if things were gonna be possible until two and a half weeks ago, which is like three and a half weeks before the show opens. And so we have been kind of scrambling to construct all of these props, to construct all of these things um, and pull all these pieces and find more things. And then we pull a piece and we're like, this is perfect. And then we try it on and it actually doesn't work. And we've been having that happen significantly, um, which has been a bit of a, a bit of a struggle. Trying to preempt accommodation requests and trying to make sure that the things that could potentially be barriers or immediately being mitigated. Um, but if there's something that we miss, if there's something that I miss and it is brought to my attention, then immediately making that change and ensuring that whatever it might be like more frequent breaks or um, more direct communication or like being more aware of the, the volume in a space, um, all of those things are like immediately adhered to and done in a way that nobody feels uncomfortable of like, oh, we're doing this so that XYZ person can focus and it's more of just this is what we're doing in the space so that everybody has access to it. Um, I think that's been one of the biggest things from an accessibility standpoint that is very intentional. There is this idea that when a group of people of a marginalized identity come together to create art, that it is a sort of therapy. If a group of people, for example, of all queer identities come together and do a play, whatever that play might be, there is this idea that it is, on the one hand, them creating art, but it is also some kind of group therapy, this special place that they can come together and be, op uh, be open and um, support each other no matter what. And that is true to a level, but that is not what we're trying to do here. Just because a group of people of a shared marginalized identity are coming together, that doesn't automatically make it a therapy session of sorts, to use quotation marks, because that idea is rooted in this, um, in our case, ableist idea, but it can be applied to sexism, homophobia, racism, transphobia, that when a group of marginalized people come together, all they're going to do is share, share their pain, um, that they are all going to reach together and cling to each other like a lifeline, and they aren't actually here to make some kind of art, they are just here to establish some kind of found family and create an ongoing therapy session, and that's not what actually happens. There is definitely a level, a feeling of safety here. We feel comfortable advocating for ourselves when there is something that we cannot do for whatever reason or don't feel comfortable doing. I, I have noticed that people feel more comfortable and I feel more comfortable saying I can't um, I, I can't or I don't want to do this or this would, can there, can we change this in some way um, for X, Y, and Z and not only do people feel comfortable stating that they need something else, something to be changed, but they also feel comfortable stating why and that doesn't open the floodgates for 
a 30 minute sob story where we get someone's entire life history of what led them up to this point. It has just created this kind of safety where we feel comfortable being ourselves and that includes setting boundaries and limits which in turn lets us further make better art. I never really thought about how like theater isn't as accessible to neurodivergent people and I was excited to figure out like ways to make it more accessible because as I started thinking more about it I was like yeah it's really the way most people do theater is not the best um, and I it made me realize a lot of instances in my own life where it wasn't great um, like especially the rehearsal process like it's often so compact and so intensive and then tech week is hell week it's called hell week for a reason um, and directors often aren't like acknowledging that there's other things going on in people's lives but like I feel there's just so, a much deeper layer of understanding with this project that I have not had previously. Accessible theater is very good. Uh, my name is Maria Sipes and I play Judy who is Christopher's mom. I think above all else I've learned to be a lot kinder to myself just from being in a neurodivergent affinity space and kind of seeing that a lot of people have the same struggles as I do and seeing how they cope with it in a healthy way. Recognizing things that I've always wanted for myself but never knew to ask for and seeing how other people are asking for that and the expectation within this space that like those requests are accommodated and that there there's like a base level of yeah like this is what we're going to proceed with going forward is something that I never even thought to ask for of I always presume that like well this is a me issue I'm just gonna deal with it and move on and like it doesn't matter that I go home and like immediately put myself in like a sensory deprivation tank because I'm so overwhelmed um but like that is not the expectation here that's not the norm here and that's been Knowing that that is something that can happen has been one of the biggest learning experiences, I think. When you're talking about accessibility and disability, that's way more important. If we have the time and the ability and the materials to do it, we're doing it. And if we don't, then we have to come up with another solution because we are not going to put someone in a situation where they are being forced to do something that physically hurts them. I think one of the things about theater and art in general is you're always finding new and different ways to do it. I mean, look back at the Greeks, women couldn't perform and now women are performing. And it used to be that you couldn't have like, you couldn't record sound, you couldn't have pretty colorful lights to symbolize different moods. It, it used to be a whole different thing, and now it's this whole big industry. So, I mean, I'm happy that this is happening, because, like, because, like, who's to say we've already come as far as we can go with theater? Like, people will complain and say, oh, you people are always complaining, it's, it's, you're saying it's never enough, and we're like, no, we know what enough is, we're just not there yet. my wonderful, amazing co-director who I love and would die for, uh, is currently in the ER. Um, we open one week from today. This was, of course, our primary concern of the time, um, but within a couple of hours, things would get exponentially worse. I got an email from the dean and I started to panic, as one does, because I, this whole process has been a mess. And I panicked, I texted you, and then you literally just like appeared outside my window within like three minutes and it was really weird, but it was really sweet. It's true, I did. And <laughs> you were just there, and then, ooh, no, I have my tank along with it. Um, <laughs> neurodivergent. Um, and then we started walking over to the dean's office, and all the way, you pulled in with Ace, because Ace was just from the ER. 
God. Which I believe I filmed something right before then. So like we and Ace tried to, to go with us. And then Ace tried to come with us in the oh, meeting. Okay. And, and we said, no. I'm not okay. Huh? You're still not <laughs> okay. <laughs> like death. And so then Lee decided to just hop in and join us. That was the only way to get to which is the only way to get there's still Lee. so now now Lee is in this forever yeah also um anyway she said that the rehearsals that there's been an investigation into the show and uh, rehearsals are being shut down until further notice um, and she doesn't know when it's gonna when the rehearsals are gonna re resume and she said that they that people in the department told about this in passing and she took it out of her own initiative to tell us but I just want to like say this for like just for the record like we went, you guys were like, we're coming with you, and I was like, um, okay, and then we walked up there, and it was like, I would feel more comfortable meeting with Sydney on their own, and you both just went, I'm sorry, I'm not comfortable with that, I will not let them be going in there alone. Also, I love how it had like a like, peer support mediator, I don't remember yeah. what it was called, like, for you, and then yeah. they were like, why are you having, like, people with you, and it's like, support. No, I think she was just caught she off guard. I think she was, she caught was not expecting that. She, she didn't think that, like, she wasn't like, what are you guys doing? She was, like, she was just, just like, like, um, oh, I was people. gonna meet with Sydney. I emailed Sydney and then there were three people there. <laughs> and then you guys came in with me, which is wonderful because I did not say a single word till like the end of that meeting and you guys handled the whole thing and you went all, I was fine. Like, I wasn't gonna cry in the meeting, but then you just fucking. <laughs> what? I did I was just like staring at the floor and I was like I'm supposed to say words now because that's how meetings work and then you were just like so if you could explain to me the implications of what this is going to be for our production and you just like went and then and then like, left to get me tissues because I started crying when you did that and then you both just like stood up and like hovered over me and then she came back in and you immediately sat down and I was like hey friends <laughs> well, I have friends. Sorry, I was just looked at Ace again and I was kind of <laughs> <laughs> First of all, formal investigation is very scary wording. It really is. I'm a little terrified about what And that that's for freaking me. That, that's freaking me. Specifically yeah. because, like... Our show goes up in, like, three days. Yeah. Yeah. Also, like, also they said... It's like, it's, 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 it's six days. That's okay, true. Thursday, though. Is yeah, so it's five days. So it's five days. Because so it's Friday. So dress. Yeah, because today's dress. Friday and first dress is the Thursday. And then that means so did they we all Can we not? <laughs> I'm just kidding, I love you. Um, um so all weekend rehearsals are cancelled. Assuming. I assuming. I, there's they no way in that they said that, until like, further notice. Yeah. And said she's gonna try to like like expedite this process. But like I can't imagine that they're gonna be working their butts off over the weekend to help our show because that's um, not gonna happen. That's also like not something they should They might though. Like I mean it's important and so we should Plan for no Saturday and Sunday. Correct. Yeah. Which is a problem, I guess. Because also, isn't you said I mean, was planning on doing a lot of lighting stuff, right? Yeah, because Aiden needs to come in on Sunday to do lights. Aiden? Oh, don't get a job. Yeah, Aiden has a full time job, which is why he needs to come in on Sunday to finish lights because lights are still because there's the one light that's broken that was we were told it was fixed that was not fixed, and so we need to figure that out. And then there's another light that like won't like we need to repatch it because it needs to get plugged in somewhere else because it wasn't working. What are you gonna do? I don't, the other thing, the other thing that I'm concerned about, right, is that we don't, we don't, all we know right now is that somebody complained somebody, something to somewhere, and that they're now launching an investigation. And so I'm concerned that when we get back up and running, whenever that's gonna be. I mean, we were gonna have a, we were gonna have a dark day on Monday night, so if we dark just, it, a dark day is no. a day off. Thank so you. we were gonna have a day off on Monday night, so if we were to uh, cancel that and put a rehearsal that day, we'd only technically miss one rehearsal. But still, like, that's gonna be after classes and after school, and so, like, and losing these, I, I know that there's, like, nothing else that can be done, but they really, no, this is really... Also, not everybody's available on Monday nights. And also, like, the weekend, the lighting stuff, if people have full-time jobs, how the hell are they going to be able to come in? Yeah. And, like, they also said we can't go to Brooke. They said that we can't go to Brooke, and then we can't, like, have do... We're not allowed to do any work, which, like, we need to label all the costumes. We need to organize all of this stuff. But then there's also the aspect, right, the, like... We can't tell anyone. We also can't talk to anybody. Oh, God. Because they, they told us we're, um, like, we just need to keep this... Yeah. Okay. But then, like, how do we communicate that with the cast? I, I don't know. <laughs> How do we go, hey, by the way, no rehearsals for the weekend. We can't tell you why. Good luck, don't get anxiety over this, and don't die. Yay. 
Yeah, I don't know. Um, can I get you anything? Something you okay? <laughs> no, we're just riding for oh, roller coaster. This is the first time something like this has happened, and it's not gonna be the last. I'm afraid to say. Um, <laughs> um, uh, now, where precisely in New Zealand would this be right now? I'm just, sorry, that's not right. I'm sorry, that's not where my brain should be going. I feel like it's after like the protest where they all get like beat up and we're like in like and crunchies and, and, crunchies crunchies and, and like, taken away. crunchy got taken away and they're all like beat up with the bruises. Oh my god, my holy groomer culture is gonna be. Oh god. Oh, that's gonna help. Shit. Fuck. Okay. <laughs> Deep breath on that. That's not something. That's not a mouth problem. <laughs> that's not a mouth problem. You know what? If if I if if things spread the way that they're gonna spread because of this institution that make me look like an asshole, but it saves the production and the mission of our production, that is worth it to me. Unfortunately. Okay. The now problem. The now problem. The now problem. The now problem is that you look like you're dying. That we need to get pretty home. <laughs> We're gonna put you to bed. Um, and, and that's gonna be good. The, the now problem is, is we're just waiting. We're we're in we're in admin purgatory. If you haven't been a part of all the other sagas that I've been through, yeah, admin seriously. purgatory. So admin purgatory, as I call it, is that whole thing when you are sitting there um, and you have like you you know that you're about to have a meeting with somebody about something important, but you're waiting for them to email about that meeting, but they could email you about that meeting and go, we're meeting in two hours, drop everything and come. So then you just can't do any work because like, like if, I was gonna, if I was gonna sit down and do a reading, I can't do that because I'm not looking at my computer, which is why I haven't done most of my readings this semester because I've been continuously in admin purgatory or in advisor purgatory or like title IX DEI purgatory because I can't do anything else to get my to-do list done for the project without getting those emails. And so, so this is just another situation yeah. of that, except it's way worse and there's a lot higher stakes and I don't know how I'm going to be able to function. Oh. Also, exams are next week and I... I'm just gonna take a second. Yeah, take a second, take your time. Deep breaths. Everyone deep breaths, baby. Right? Maybe that needs to die on. But like, when we get everybody back together, there's gonna be animosity in the cast, and I don't know how we're gonna be able to fix that social dynamic because trust is gone, and we don't have time to do trust building workshops. But like, we obviously are gonna make time. But just speaking of that, okay, okay that what bad. sort of health and safety concern? What? I mean, the first obvious one is rehearsal length because there's that was the discussion okay, that happened. That was people that shit that people have been complaining about backstage too. Yeah. They've been like, bitching about you, it. You cut like rehearsals from what's like, what the. What was the other plot? So the, yeah, so there was a, there was a main stage Mount Holyoke show that happened directly before Curious, and it was student directed. So from the outside, like it's it's technically a different thing than what I'm doing, but from the outside, it looks it's like the same project. Senior cause... project? Theirs was so, it's a, so yeah, mine's a senior project. Okay. It's not a, a, like an independent study. It's not technically like a main stage show, um, but we are trying to make them look the same. And so from the outside, they do look the same. So it looks like us getting no resources looks like it, we're being discriminated against, which that's not the whole point. Anyway, um, but anyway, that show, their tech rehearsals were like every single night for two weeks from like 6 to 11 p.m. And they had a nine hour rehearsal on a Saturday. I took their tech schedule, they gave it to me, and I cut it in half and I took an hour off of every night. Yeah, as you know, outsider of this whole thing and also outsider of like theater in general, the rehearsals I went to seemed very chill in terms of like we were just timing. we literally just run through the whole show like it's not like we were like wasting like okay so health and safety things we know that the that the rehearsal length is bullshit um five eleven um Godspeed. the Godspeed. other Godspeed. thing first. would be the swiss army knife but it's but that's dumb. already been handled and, it's and for yeah there's a swiss army knife in the show and it's specifically listed as Swiss Army Knife. Like you can't like this show is very specific. About I have brands. Swiss Army Knife in my bag right now. I also that's do. Not, that's yeah, not a thing. But anyway, thing. but it's also we learned. Thirty learn, years old and we're it's in a disgusting. Drawer. Yeah, oh, mine's and it's new. really really and dull. But the thing is, is we learned over email the other day that apparently it's supposed to have been cropped. Do you want to fish you? Um, we learned that it was supposed to be. We learned that it was supposed to be a, a, a prop and not like. Oh, get some sleep. And not like here. Make sure this one gets home. Yeah, we'll absolutely will do. Okay. Love you. Okay. 
careful. Don't die. <laughs> um, but we learned that apparently we are su we are supposed to be using a prop knife and not a real knife. Yeah. And like I guess that makes yeah, sense. That makes but sense. like yeah. I didn't think about that, and nobody told me that. And, and like it was double tech. And oh, also like our visors were in at the read through in December. And I feel like it would have been like, oh, heads up about props. We've been talking to them about props regularly. It's also been in the rehearsal It's been in the rehearsal videos. Which they should be watching because that's what they said they'd be. So, but anyway, that aside, that's a whole situation. But we did get an email about it a couple days ago, and then we switched it. And we have the, we have a, a, a clay printed us, a 3D printed us one that's fake. That we have, and it's perfect. So we fixed that problem. So that being an allegation makes no sense, because that's done. Rehearsal length makes no sense. And frankly, if rehearsal length is the reason, if this got to the FMT, like, the professor should have laughed this out of their offices, because yeah. this is how theater works. This is how theater I'm works. not saying that that's not accept- like, well, I'm not well, saying- It's not accessible. But like, so tech- it's... tech is not accessible, and I don't know how to fix that, and nobody knows how to fix that. That's not come up in any of my readings at all. And we tried to make it accessible by having less time. And our okay. are very chill, and very reasonable in length, and we have plenty of breaks. Yeah, I need to go. Okay. Bye! Bye. 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 You. Good luck! And... Uh, good luck, don't die, and make sure this will- Ah, shit. Sorry. I just wanted to make sure this one doesn't die. Will do. Keep me updated. I'll text you guys. I love you guys. Okay. Bye. Bye. Um. Where was I? You were talking about how the rehearsal length helped the Yeah. Process. And so <laughs> if. <laughs> okay. And so if they if these complaints were brought to the FMT department and the if the S FMT department like allowed them like brought them up a further level, then there must be some level of dishonesty about. Either the only way that the FMT department could have taken complaints about rehearsal length seriously is if people lied about it. The only the alternative is that these people went to a different section of admin who doesn't know anything about theater, and then they're taking this out of context. Because if you think about how theater works, right? We are on ladders working with light stuff. We are like there's so many because health and safety. You give us an ADA non-compliant building, and you are concerned about health and safety with rehearsal length. I'm sorry, that feels frustrating to me. Um, Especially given all the complaints that you've made throughout this entire process. I spent that they the whole addressed. year calling them out. So I this only, get through. So that's why I think they went to somebody else, and I don't know who they went to, but they probably went to somebody pretty high up in admin. How they got a meeting, that I don't know, because I've been trying to do this all year about my complaints, about a lot of concerns that I've had with this production and our lack of resources and our lack of support, and I've been ghosted continuously, and I have written proof of that. There could have been, there was like a discussion about heat that one day that it was like really hot, but like we told them that they could all like take off their jackets if they needed to, and some people offered to do that, and like it was fine. I love how energetic you guys are about fighting for this. Mm -hmm. I have been fighting for this. Yeah all year yeah. and at this point like I'll keep pushing but I need y'all to leave that because I just don't cut it any anymore yeah that's I true. I just ah uh, I've been in fight or flight since like January yeah. um and it's I'm not saying I'm giving up. I don't want. I want to be very clear that I'm not giving up, and I think that this show can go forward. I think it's gonna be fine. I don't think that what we put forward is gonna be anything like what we had imagined or what we had been told to expect, or any level of artistic. It's gonna be good, but it's not gonna be great. What we what we wanted, and I also know that the college, the second that we do our show, are gonna be like, "Wow, look how successful they were. They made history." Blah blah blah. And I don't want them to take credit for this because they're the reason that we're doing all of this instead of me doing my homework today. Mm -hmm. And this is not the first time this has happened. Mm -hmm. And it's, again, it's not going to be the last. As consequence of the investigation, losing rehearsal time, the loss of an opportunity for the cast and crew to be together and trust the theater making project, the college has canceled the show. Um, so I'm sure that this is something that a lot of you have been suspecting or worrying about. And that unfortunately has been the result of what has happened. The original point of this production was to show the world that things need to change in theater in regards to accessibility and how to do it. And not only have we done that, but we've also shown how they need to change in so many other ways as well. Thank you to my cast and crew for your talent and dedication to this cursed little project of ours. Sure, we never got the traditional audience we imagined, but in a sad way, this feels like a fitting ending. And more importantly, one that will make more waves in the world than our unequivocal success ever could. While the show may be done, we are not, our story is not, and the fight for what is right is not. We're just getting started. In solidarity, Sydney. I want to thank my co-director Grace and my friends Evan and Lee who were absolutely 
magical human beings throughout this entire thing. Truly, everybody just dropped everything and ran full speed to the crisis at hand in full formal wear, with milkshakes for breakfast, games of bananagrams in between, composing emails, late night pizza on my floor, screaming to the newsy soundtrack to make ourselves feel more energized after having pulled two like nearly all nighters in a row. And blessed is not a word. It should be. No. <laughs> no, it's not. It's oh, not. it is B L E S S E D. Yeah, there's no T in blessed. Bless. Where did you get it's the that? past. It's the past version of that word. I forgot how words are spelled. Hello, I'm I'm Eben. This is Toby. Um, I don't know why I sound like a robot. Uh, I played Ed, uh, Christopher's father, and um, I've been helping out since the closure of the show. I'm Lee Rizeki. I'm a sophomore at Mount Holyoke College. I have been working with Curious Incident. I did a couple of rehearsals with um, specifically working with the lighting and have been involved in a lot of the kind of more administrative process and props. I did a couple props as well. I made some popsicles and a pitchfork. I was so focused on helping, on helping Sydney and help manage this sinking ship and advocate for what I could and help out in any way that I didn't I did not really <laughs> experience too many emotions about the close of the show. Um, until later. Until later, and... It just really sucks because we put in all this work and... No one... Will get to see it in a meaningful way. It was devastating, and also it was almost a little bit of relief because it meant the whole trying to figure out how the hell to save the production and that the anxiety and the scramble of that weekend it meant that was over but it also meant the show was over and that was devastating for everyone involved. I, I learned that the power is in the hands of the administrators to, the, to such a degree that they don't even realize how much control they have and how much they can do um, and they just kind of think that their hands are tied and that they can't do certain things and that certain things are off limits. It's definitely interesting um, the surprise with, that the administrators showed when we would talk about neurodivergency and we would talk about how inaccessible the, the college is as though it was something that they hadn't heard before, something that they didn't know. Um, even these departments that are set up for the express purpose of helping advocate for students and even upper level administrators at this school who that at this school that proclaims to fight for their students and encourage them to grow in in ways that enable them to be a change maker in their communities, et cetera, et cetera. When it gets down to it at the at the board in the boardrooms and et cetera, they the action is not present as much. Very good intentions and not as much follow through. Um, discomfort with change. What I learned from this whole process is that there are people in Edmonton who do actually care about neurodivergence and about advocating for disability. And it was really interesting to see through the whole process of working with admin, how we kind of, our perspectives on a lot of the different individuals change as we were working with them and as we got to know them. And they kind of revealed that they did have, like, that they genuinely did care and they did want to make an impact. And they, the way that they were going about it might not have been the best sometimes, but that they were trying. And so really trying to work with understanding other people's perspectives and where they're coming from. Oh, I, we were, we were, <laughs> I really think that Mount Holyoke should be utilizing um, its policies more. I think that they should be trying to put them out there more. My favorite policy that we found was the policy on policies. Every Mount Holyoke policy must adhere to the policy on policies and all policies therein. Um, the policy on policies is like a weird template for policies that has, the word policy means nothing to me anymore. It's lost all, it's lost all meaning. It's, it's just a collection of sounds. Before I became involved with the administrative side of this, I had already heard rumors about the production I am not in the theater department whatsoever. My only affiliation is through a couple of friends I have. And so how these rumors got back to me is a little bit um, just kind of representative of the rumor culture at Mount Holyoke. It's quite impressive how quickly information gets around and how it gets around to the entire campus. And so 
was talking with someone before all of the, yeah, before I had been and in, become involved with any of the administrative side, was talking to one of, like, a friend of a friend, and they were saying, um, and they had some comments, um, mostly negative, about Sydney specifically and about the production in general. You can say comments if you want. I don't remember the comments. Okay. Um, and they were all clearly something that they had heard from multiple other, that they had heard from other people who had heard from other people. And so I didn't know it was very difficult to go, yeah, these are 100% true or these are 100% false because you don't know who the information is coming from. And so even without being involved in the production I, and without being involved in the theater department whatsoever, I was hearing rumors about the production and about Sydney, which from what I knew about Sydney at that point, from just, you know, having dinners with them, didn't seem to hold any bearing. And as I learned from the last couple of weeks, they're just kind of completely false and generated by kind of one group of people. There was a lot of rumors that were, um, a lot of rumors about why it was canceled and that were incredibly detrimental to the cast and crew who were hearing them. Some of the social dynamics of my school, because it's so small, get really toxic really quickly. And then like, if you have a falling out with one friend group that's toxic, then all of a sudden every single person on campus knows those rumors about you and then you, and it's weird. And that's happened to me twice now, um, which sucks. And it's also hard because like, I do YouTube full time. I also work another job and I used to work a third job and then also school. So like, I don't like hang out with people regularly. I'm usually just sitting alone in my room doing work. Um, and so that also lets that kind of culture really spiral out of control of, of rumors and all that stuff. Because most people on this campus only know of me by my online presence and not like by me as a human because I'm just not around. Yeah, social pressure and consequences have really played a part in the dissolving of the show. Um, in the last, in the, even before it got shut down, people would, I had uh, a couple of people who would approach me in the dining hall and say, I heard you're involved with Curious, are you okay? And now that it's over, people are, are whispering, people are, are looking weirdly at the three of us when we're eating dinner together in the, uh, in the dining hall. Uh, someone, I heard that someone said that the knife was sharpened and pointed at people in a threatening manner. I heard that Sydney threatened to kill themselves if, like, people complained about the show. I, I've heard all these ludicrous things and, um, and it's really been affecting... I am concerned about how it's affecting the legacy of the show and just the way that people are thinking about it because there are all of these lies and rumors and Mount Holyoke... God love us, no one gives a shit about the truth, we just want to gossip. I would like to know about what is going on from their angle because no one ever thinks they're the bad guy and as much as I as much as I personally have felt like like there are a lot of the social conditions that made this play fall apart have been put together with malintent um, incompetence and weaponized incompetence uh, I'm sure that that's not what those people feel and I'm sure that that's not what feels right to them. And I am interested in what in what their side is. I want to know. So the um, the yes. the plan of action for this the plan evening. of action for the, the plan evening. of action for this evening. Wait, let me let me join this one. What are the action items? The action items. I mean, the circle. Action items are, are our thing. Yeah. Um, Sydney's not even in frame. I'm not in frame. <laughs> now you are. The action items are a thing, but um, the college didn't agree to them, so. <clears throat> what is this meeting again? We don't have that, that's the next problem. Okay, so anyway, so, so we need to thing. explain, we're gonna explain all I'm of the- I'm guessing all of us are gonna be there. Yes, yeah. we're gonna explain all of the reasons that we have gotten to this point. Um, I'm worried you're not in frame when I sit down, that's a problem. Who? Evan. <laughs> <laughs> like now you, now you be. That's just. Uh, weird. And then we can also, in that lore, explain to them why they were expecting just one of us walking into that meeting and got so many of us because that is a reflection of how we've been treated. Yeah. Oh yeah. The accessibility. Okay. The first thing that we definitely want them to fix is to talk about the reporting system because the fact that mm -hmm. 
Like, I understand that DEI is overworked and underpaid, and that's a whole other situation. However, the students don't feel safe or listened to on this campus because they know that there's nothing to report to and are afraid of detaching their names to things because the school is so small. The bias report has one person behind it. There are definitely incidents of the bias of experience of dead and, like, you know, yeah. misgendering, misnaming, uh, like, not just of me, of other students, and then just, like, blatant disrespect of accommodations of, like, all that I say, under all of it. and, it, like, all of it falls under it, but I'm, like, I don't want to overload the system. I'm, the reason I have it is because I'm, like, these are not complaints that affect any, that affect me enough that I want to do anything about it because the system's so overloaded with complaints that are way more pressing. There needs to be something on accessibility, disability services, accommodations. Teachers need to know of disability services. Here's the thing. <laughs> my workshop explains all of this. Yeah, I know. I know. And my workshop is 90 minutes, and I can expand it to 120. I would like to expand it to 120, personally, because I have to cut a bunch of slides. But I, everything that we're asking the faculty to know, I have already taught to the faculty, and I have given them, yeah. mm -hmm, I taught it at my Boom workshop, and I had three different professors go, oh my god, do this again, please. And I said, I will, but I need to people. That's the thing. There was a bunch of people from like LITS, or there's like there's like a postdoc student. There are a lot of people who are from like, that are like professor professors, but like, yeah, I some professors. people in my time. Okay, um, we need to explain, I think part of the disconnect is also professors don't know what the hell is happening on our side, which is an issue across the world. Which again, I explained. Yeah. All of these problems, if we just had the faculty come sit down at my workshop and I explain because I want to sit down at your workshop. Because I in well. in it you're welcome to. I in it I explain because I was a student and I was a teacher and then I became really disabled and then I was a teacher and then I was a student. And so I have a whole host of weird knowledges that I put together and I explain I understand that to it as a teacher, this feels like this to you. Does it have a presentation of this? Mm -hmm. Can I can you share that with me? Yeah, I want to see it. I want to see this. Yeah, I'm realizing, I'm realizing yeah we, I'm we just want you to like give us this workshop. So like, I'd like to know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ac accessible website. It's it's bad. It's real bad. Yeah. Um, the website's a problem. I will make it an independent study of mine. That's how we do it. I make it an independent study of what. Rebuild the website. Rebuild the website. Like, hey, the amount we of talked broken about link sign counter frustrates me. We talked about doing an independent study together. Like. They email. Okay, when I was trying to figure out stuff, I was trying to figure it out on my own to like input events or like figure stuff out. Also, memory's cool. I can show myself. Yes, I was gonna ask. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. Um. And then I wasn't. All the links were broken, and so then I would email people those offices. And they'd be like, "There's a link on the website," and I'd be like, um, "It doesn't work anymore. May you please help me with this?" And they'd be like, "Oh, here's another link," and then they would give me another broken link. Reflecting on the last couple weeks and how much the four of us have been complimented by people in our lives, by the faculty of this institution, by the administration of this institution, for how like professional and put together and organized we all are. And um, I feel like I just want to take a second to acknowledge um, how, yeah, we are, um, but that comes at a cost. I have another meeting with um, administration tomorrow and I, have spent the last two hours trying to put together my notes and organize everything and figure out how to talk to people and how to be a human and all of these things and I spent 30 minutes picking out what I was going to wear very strategically. I know that I cannot get anything done tomorrow morning before the meeting and I will not be able to get anything done tomorrow afternoon after the meeting because I know that I will be so exhausted um, that I will not be able to get things done and so I am going to be staying up late tonight to finish getting my work done because I don't know how long it's going to take for my energy to come back in order to function again um, and I have deadlines to, to meet and like I just I think Part of what people are going to take away from, from all of this is like, wow, these neurodivergent people are so put together and so organized and whatever. And while we are, you don't see the hours and hours of thought and prep work that we have to put in, in order to come across that way, in order to function that way. And that's not saying that we are not capable people, um, but in the sense of 
we're, we've been going into a lot of meetings with faculty and professors and, and administration where there's an inherent power dynamic and we know that we as neurodivergent people, if we are authentically ourselves, will not be taken seriously because of society, discrimination, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. We have to strategically plan our masks, plan, script our words, and really think through how we want to come across and how we how we want to appear to the universe and what we what we want out of interactions and that is exhausting um it, it both shows our dedication to the work and to wanting to make the world better um and the amount of energy we're, we're willing to put into that but also the reason i'm acknowledging this is because we need to acknowledge that the systems that we have in place right now are not inclusive and not accessible and force us to take extra hours out of our lives to figure out how to be a specific version of what we assume presentable looks like, or not what we assume, what we know presentable looks like to um, people in power. And we know that if we act a certain way, we will be taken seriously. And if we act another way, a way that is more inclusive and accessible and safe for us, we will not be taken seriously. Even though we have the same things to say, no matter how we put ourselves forth. And the amount of exhaustion and effort and anxiety and time that that takes and how much that that takes out of us as as people and how much better activists we would be if we didn't have to spend extra time focusing on these things and the frustration of having to even be put in this situation in the first place but then also like the pride of like wow i get to be able to do this i am able to do this and that's really cool but then at what cost you know um so yeah that's just been a thing i've been reflecting upon and i wanted to to have that documented doing the right thing sucks sometimes and there's always that level of how much is this time, energy, effort, exhaustion worth it? And is the activist life one that is sustainable? And the answer is no. And yet somehow I can't imagine myself doing anything else and I can't stop going back to it no matter how much I try to take breaks. So there's that, <laughs> but um, yeah. Just, that's the stuff that you don't see because we are so caught up in our brains of planning through things that we forget to turn on a camera during that, during that time. Um, when that is objectively some of the most important time to be documenting. All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> this investigation was concluded on Monday after we met with them and then they continue to not tell us anything about them. And they continue to what email us. They continue to email us like, like, like we we're still in the trouble. investigation like is we still pending. pending. Yeah, the investigation is still pending. We don't have answers. We don't have answers. And we were like, oh my god, are also, we gonna get expelled? Oh my also god, oh my god. Clarified throughout this meeting and the entire process, they didn't say any policies or guidelines they were following. They're not following policies. No, they didn't. But they, they did also say, okay, they pull your window down. Also, I love the clarification. I, I love the clarification in one of the emails that we are specifically following policies and guidelines, and then in this meeting, so knowing we're actually they confirmed not. that they were not following any policies. The policy on policies failed. The policy on policies. Uh, no, okay, but like they did say that they concluded in both investigations that we did nothing wrong, and exactly. I think that is important. They concluded we that did nothing wrong. wrong. We did nothing wrong. <laughs> nothing wrong. There was no no collusion. <laughs> also, I'm sorry, that was two weeks ago that this was concluded and they haven't told us. It has been two weeks yep. that it took for them to tell us and we have had multiple emails and conversations with them and it has taken them two full weeks to tell us. Actually, over two full also, weeks Also, I'm sorry. To tell us, hey, your investigation was concluded. By the way, Cindy stop and I panicking are... about your careers and your life. Cindy, you're a graduate and Ace is in trouble. It like, took you two weeks to say that? Wow, this is also for the lovely camera. This is finals week. Finals start tomorrow. Uh, Sydney would like to graduate. My I would like to graduate. Well, he told me I was going to graduate. So if anybody was going to get in trouble, it was going to be this one. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, that was good. That was my thing of like, I know Sydney's going to be able to graduate, but how is this going to impact? Okay, so recap we of what happened. I got the uh, we, we, yeah, we did. Well, I, I think we, like we don't need to recap, but we know no, no. what uh, we're we're, out of the, we're in the clear. 
Um, we need that report. We deserve that. We deserve they're that not going to tell us. If they they don't they didn't want to tell us who they specified. It's not honor code. It's not by support, and it's not the they other one. They specified that it's not. They specified that it was investigation with a small eye. That there was not actual formal process, processes. Formal processes. Well, they made it sound throughout this entire like it, situation. They, no, they like said they at one point this was a formal thing. I, well, they said the word. I swear the word. And they said that they had to adhere to the call to the specific. They said in one email that they had to adhere to the specific policies and guidelines of the investigation of the process. college. There of the, was, but then oh. they just told us that they don't have to because it's a little investigation. Yeah. So that's what so, that was confusing. And that their part of the process of what they came to in this investigation was developing a process for exactly this kind of thing happening. Yeah. So by and, the way, uh, do we want to close that shape? And now you have to leave that bit into the documentary. Otherwise, it's going to be a continuity error. You're a continuity error. Thank hey. you. <laughs> Sometimes backgrounds just change. Here, we can change the angle of it so it just looks this like a mission. Help. Yes, it does. What Just specifically did she say to you guys as we were, we were walking out that made you want to cry? Oh, it was so sweet. I was like, um, I said something. I, I didn't take notes because we were walking out. Yeah. Um, I said something about like accessible I, was just I look forward like, to working yeah, with you to yeah, yeah, accessible That's change. what I said. And, and she, she, she said, said, like, me too. Genuinely, no, truly, I do. And like she looked, like, and, like she made looked eye contact. Right I, I, I was and, like her to her need to make sure that Lee was like looking at her to like, be, like no, truly. <laughs> she was like, no, truly. I, I was, I was, was walking. Eye contact, like I was walking out, but I heard it. Oh, okay. Damn. Dead ass. Damn. Damn. Okay. So <laughs> the thesis of the documentary is that the college is actually willing to change. So maybe they don't. So it's not the college's problem; it's the FMT department. Which yeah. Okay. Like I when I was talking to. The restorative justice guy who led my training, he said, is that, he mentioned that he had um, done two restorative things with theater departments in colleges. And afterwards, I was like, oh, I was just interested, I would love to know more about that because he talked about that. And he said, like, yeah, it was very interesting working with them because you expect, like, arts departments and stuff to be, like, very open to, like, this kind of stuff. And the theater department was, like, one of the most difficult, like, things on college campuses that I'd ever worked with. He said it was like the theater departments are so like stuck in their ways, and also that like they're so like unopen to criticism. And, and that's like, why I do the yes. job that I do. Action item for next year: the FMT department will apparently have a more robust process for these types of projects because they have no process. We would like to know what that means, and um, one thing would love to know what that means. And also, like they they also mentioned that there would be more guidelines for advice. Yeah, there's a difference between going use a hands off meaning we don't want you in our rehearsals, but we want to talk like behind the scenes. And they, and uh, what they took that to mean was, I'm not going to do anything. And then when they yeah. did do things, it was always over micromanaging the pieces that I completely had figured out and ignoring all the bits that I didn't understand. And then and the bits that you asked for help with. And the bits yeah. that I asked for help or with. Or post happening a critique, like, oh, this thing already happened, but we're going to tell you it was wrong. Yeah, it was it. always a like two, three weeks later them being like, well, you shouldn't have done it this way, so that's why it went wrong. Blah blah. And I'm like, well, okay. I asked you about it. I asked you about this while, and also there's the aspect of like. When I when I was trying to find new people for the project after everybody left in yeah. end of January, they just kept meeting with me, being like, "How's finding people going? How's finding people going?" And then I talked to a friend who's a UMass professor, and the UMass pro professor was like, "Oh, have they like emailed the department? Like they can email the department, they can email departments of other colleges, they can reach out to other people." And I was like, "I didn't know that was an option." Like how they if treat normal like productive. If you're not gonna tell us what the complaints were, we deserve to know what's like gonna be going for. Forward, it like, change. yeah, it can be shorthand of the official document, but also like, is the is the official document really needed, like, to be kept secret? Are they're not going to name drop people in the document, and if they are, they can just take those names out. But at the very least, if they only want to give us one thing, we deserve the findings. We don't, at this point, I don't care what the questions were because we know for a fact that all of them were proved to be well, not what they kind of when we asked that question of like, hey, can we have the findings? They went like, this is kind of like a. They went with the one, we don't want, like, essentially we don't want you guys to retaliate, and their other response was kind of like, we don't, um, was like, this was not an official report, and it kind of made it seem like there were no, nothing official, and like there weren't official findings from anyone. This is the problem, is that because it's not official report, because they're not following guidelines, they are free to keep as much information from us as they want. Which is yeah. a problem! And I don't think they're doing this out of malice or anything, mm -hmm. like, we don't want to tell them anything. No, but definitely not. Um, I think that because there's no guidelines, their automatic response because of how academia works is to go, we're not going to say anything about anything to anyone because the less Keep their cards the, the less information that is known by people, the better because that's how academia works is like as little yeah. communication as possible. Also, clarifying thing, yeah. they said at one point that the meeting, that the investigation had been concluded yesterday and then they said at another point that it had been concluded. 
included Monday. They were talking about there was two different investigations. Yes, I was just clarifying. So yeah, so the first investigation was the health and safety issues. I got that. Yeah, so I'm just saying it for camera. So the first investigation was health and safety issues that was figured out when we got that email at like 10:45 a.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, y
we had consistent things like that where we were like, um, is this not what we were told was gonna happen? And they're like, nope, that never happened. And I'm like, I have written proof of it. And they're like, nope, never happened. And so we just had a lot of struggles with communication and uh, discussions because we were operating on what we were told and we were keeping track of what we were told and then those people were changing what they were saying. And unfortunately, because they were advisors and an admin or whatever, they held a lot more power over this project than we do as students. And so I was relying on them to step up and say, yeah, these are problems and we don't know how to fix them, but we're willing to learn from you to figure out how to fix them and to actually do the work to fix them. And that consistently did not happen time and time again. Um, and so all of the things that we needed to change to make things accessible never happened. Um, not not all of them, but a lot of them because people were afraid to question norms and to go up the food chain and say, hey, I have a student who has this accessibility concern and this is how they propose that we fix it. Um, and this is how I would like to support them to do it. It was just like a, wow, yeah, we wish you luck on that. And then just sitting and watching everything happen. And then when things went wrong, because I had to start to change things myself to make them accessible, they were like, wow, things went wrong. That's your fault that things went wrong. And I'm like, well, I didn't know, which is why Newsies has meant so much to us <laughs> because in the in the show Newsies and also like the movie, but we haven't seen that. We're focusing on the show. In the show, they all get in like a yes, this is wrong, but we all want to strike, and we're all going to stand up for what's right. It's going to be amazing. But when times get hard, they all went, oh, I don't actually want to deal with this. It's easier to just run away. And I think that we saw a lot of that in how we were treated by faculty, how we were treated by administration, and also how we were treated by people within the cast and crew as well. Um, and. So we had a lot of turnover in people because what we were doing was inherently pushing against systems. And a lot of people were afraid to do that because they were like, oh, but if I push against a system, that's gonna affect my career, that's gonna affect my whatever. Um, and it's really frustrating because it's like, yes, it is, it might affect your career. However, as people are gonna hate as you're pushing right now, we've always pushed in very kind, clear, here's what we need, here's why we need it, here's how you can make it happen, how you can support us. Ways that don't really put somebody out on a limb in the way that like, we're, we're not running and yelling at people telling them everything we're doing is wrong. We know you weren't here when the system was built. We know you weren't here when the ADA non-compliant building was constructed. We're not blaming you for that system. We're asking you to join with us to be a part of that change making and that is very much, we had a bunch of people jump in and say, I wanna do that and then realize what work that actually took and then decide, never mind, I don't want to do that, or say that, like, I was manipulating them for my will or whatever, like, those kinds of things, when, like, I didn't mean to do that. It was literally like a, these are the things that need to get done in order to change the institution to be a better place, and it is going to be putting ourselves out on a limb a little bit, but that's what activism takes. And I think we have a culture here at Mount Holyoke where everybody's like, I'm an activist, and I care so much about activism because I posted one infographic on my Instagram story, and they don't actually think about the work of activism. Um, and it was definitely, that was our biggest, our biggest challenge was the amount of support that we had in words and the amount of people that wanted to make this possible. But then when it actually took effort to make that possible, all of a sudden that was too scary and it was too much and they didn't want to do it anymore. Um, and that was just consistently a frustration that, that we were we were met with throughout this entire process. We kept reaching out to other people to try to get help being like, hey, Dean so-and-so, like we're overwhelmed. We don't know how to, how to handle this. And then uh, that for some reason never really helped either. It was just, the whole thing was just like, ah, I don't even know how to explain it. It was, it, my mom calls it like a death by a thousand cuts. Like we just had a lot of tiny things that don't matter on their own that all just came together to make this cluster muck of a disaster that ended up finally taking down our show. Do you want to say anything on like the health and safety? Or like the fact that like we still haven't like, we still haven't gotten the report back or anything like that? Okay, so all these complaints about rehearsal times being long, I don't know, whatever, you can cut this out of the documentary if you want, but it would also would be fun to have <laughs> an angry spiel. This is how theater fucking works. Like, when I was in high school, even in frickin' high school, we were doing Pippin in my in my theater. We would be in rehearsal until midnight during tech week. And 
It's infuriating. Um, this is how it works. These complaints should have been laughed off of the table. Do you think um, that restore um, if we had been given the ability throughout this process and now and forwards um, to have uh, restorative circles instead of this secluded like we can't you can't communicate we t can't tell you this but have like options for a sort of circle with like the cast and possible perpetrators and anyone else involved any of the stakeholders that that could have helped a lot of this yeah i think communication very rarely makes things worse and communication was what we were missing the entire time the entire process and yeah i think that would have helped we were going to make that short like I don't know, seven episode documentary series about the different design aspects of the show and the making of the production to teach, pe teach people how to make accessible theater. And we were like, how are we gonna talk about this stuff without talking about this stuff? Because we don't want to seem ungrateful, we don't want to get in trouble, whatever, whatever. Um, and in closing the show, we've now had that door open in that we can talk about this stuff more now um, and people will believe us because the show didn't happen. Um, and it doesn't sound like we're being, you know, a lot of people, when, when we complain about issues with the show, they're like, you should be grateful for what you have. You're just being whiny, whatever. Um, but now that the show has not happened, and we say, we've been dealing with X, Y, and Z this whole process, people actually believe that. And we are now able to hold our college accountable um, for those things. And they seem very willing to work with us to actually make change here, which I'm really thrilled about. I'm not thrilled about like doing DEI work for free. For the college <laughs> but it's the right thing to do um and we have the skill set to do it as a team hello so it is 11 34 a.m on monday may 15th i meet with admin at noon um to talk through all of our access concerns about about the college and um potential solutions and hopefully they seem willing to listen to us i'm very hopeful about that this is <coughs> Our first meeting as a group of, of the four of us, this is the very first meeting that has not had, that has been a solo meeting. It is just me. I'm going to go do this myself, which is fine because like, this is my job and I do this for work. And so like, I'm gonna be okay. Um, but I'm also really anxious about it. Um, but I spent the last hour and a half, two hours putting together all of our notes about access concerns in lots of different pockets of the college um, into a two page document that kind of breaks down um, all of those concerns, why they're concerns, what the impacts of those things are, and how we propose that, that they uh, could be changed to make life better for disabled students, but also for all other minority students, because most of these things are trauma-informed things, and trauma-informed practices help everybody. Um, so I've been brushing up on my knowledge of various things, reading some legislation this morning, um, putting all of that together. So I'm feeling pretty confident in this document that we've made and pretty confident in, in their willingness to listen to us and I hope that the meeting is gonna go really well. Um, but I'm also just preemptively exhausted and the fact that I read through most of the OSHA guidelines yesterday to figure out a couple things for this is kind of absurd and a weird use of my time. The goal is, is that I'm gonna go in there, I'm gonna have this document, gonna kind of talk through um, like we understand everybody's trying their best and that this is kind of a blind spot for people and we are here to help you. And then I have a bunch of sources and resources for them to further look at um, mostly my research and um, stuff branched off, branching off of my research to um, if they're interested in learning about these things and about accessible education, which they seem very interested in. I think it's gonna go great, hopefully. And then I'm gonna like go get a smoothie or something to celebrate having uh, done all of this because it's exhausting. And yes, it is my job. And I want to acknowledge that this is my job, but also when I do it for a job, I get paid for it. And I'm not being paid here. Um, so <laughs> yeah, but anyway, that was a lot of things, but I just wanted to come on here and give you a little rundown of what is about to happen, hopefully. Um, and I will get back to you when it's done. That went so well. It went so well. Um, oh my gosh. <laughs> like. Like they're actively going to make changes to be more accessible like tonight. Like they already came up with some things to work on to start changing things immediately and said like, you know, she can't do everything to fix all the things that I brought up, but she knows who to go to about those things to make them happen. And overall it was just a really safe, healthy conversation. 
and it was just so wonderful and she genuinely like listened to what I had to say which is like a low bar but still um because we often see people like with institutions get defensive about the institution and say we're trying our best this shouldn't be this way um it shouldn't be as bad as you're saying it is but she was very much like yeah no that checks out like I wish I'd known about this sooner I'm doing my best like thank you for letting me know how do you propose that this thing might come across to students or should we go across this way or what do you think of with your lived experience um and oh my gosh it was just so incredible and it went so well and i am exhausted but also very energized um yeah uh i think the idea of real change at this college is actually going to happen um which has been the goal from day one <laughs> but it never happened because nobody wanted to listen to us and i kept going to people and having those people say you know, this is too absurd, or you can't actually be discriminated against this much, or nobody would be this blatantly ableist, you're making it up, I refuse to listen to you, I refuse to make things better, I refuse to hold people accountable. And she was like, no, that checks out. And I will hold people accountable, and we will be making changes, and we will be looking into this to make it a better student experience, because it shouldn't have been like this for you. And I have heard that before from a handful of other people at this institution, but not from any of the ones who hold as much power as the people, uh, person that I met with today. Sorry, I'm being vague because I don't think we're going to use people's names in this, uh, in the documentary. Um, but I, I'm just, just, uh, just wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. And it sucks. It sucks that this change has, th these conversations and these calls for change have been ignored up until now in my literal last week ever of being on this campus. Um, but they happened, finally. And maybe I'm just a wishful thinker, but I genuinely, I feel like this one worked. I feel like this one, this one's gonna stick. It was really sad and heartbreaking to lose something that we had spent so much time and energy and money and all of this stuff on. And this, this belief that we could make change and we could create this thing that had never been done before. And to have it, to, to know that it, it didn't happen, kind of makes the, the initial gut reaction is like, well, if they couldn't do it, nobody can. Um, and I knew that as soon as we knew that it was gonna, it, the show wasn't gonna happen, I was like, the amount of people who are gonna lose hope in the industry because we failed. I don't know, I just keep thinking about, I hung out with a friend the other day who I haven't seen since like a week before Curious started to fall apart. It'd been falling apart for a while, but you know, the specific weekend that everything fell apart. And they looked at me and they went, you have light in your eyes again for the first time in a long time. And like, I knew that, <laughs> but at the same time, hearing somebody else notice it and say that was just fascinating because like we had been working so, so hard and so many extra hours because all of the time that I planned to devote to working on this project ended up getting devoted to writing emails to six different people in administration asking for help um, because I wasn't getting the support that I needed. Ended up dealing with social situations that were objectively pointless. and dealing with a lot of other things that were not supposed to be part of this project. The constant threat of, oh, they're gonna take away my show. Oh, they're gonna take away my show has been hanging over my head for a year. And in the way that all of this went down, I lost the show. I lost most of my friends. I had to quit one of my jobs because I wasn't able to keep up with it in order to continue with the show um and also like all of my career prospects that i was working on very much all went out the window like i literally have lost most everything i came into the semester with being like this is what my spring's gonna be all of it gone and i feel weirdly rejuvenated by that if that makes any sense i don't think that makes any sense um but like there's something very refreshing about having absolutely everything completely explode and fall apart and know that I'm going to be able to put it back together again. So, yeah.
it sucks that everything ended as it did, but it does feel in a weird way how this project was meant to end. Um, and I'm very at peace with it. And I'm also very at peace with the fact that now we have a lot more advocacy work to do and it's actually going to really make a, a difference, hopefully. If, if they listen to what we have to say, I hope that they will. Um, so it's not that we quit or that we stop fighting, but that we're fighting in a completely different direction. The future that we imagine for this is not at all what it turned out to be or what it's going to be, but I think we're all better off for it in a weird way. Curious, incident. May she rest in peace. <laughs> hey, it's Ace. I don't know if you'll find this in the terabyte of footage that you're going through, but if you do, you are required to include it. I know that you're self-conscious about everything that happened, and you do feel like it's your fault, but I want you to know that that's, that's not true. This production was very important, and even though we weren't able to put it on, everything that we went through, experienced, and learned from it was just as valuable. Even though we couldn't put on the final show, we were able to get super far. And in a way, the act of us not being able to put on a final show displays the difficulties that neurodivergent people in theater and institutions are facing in a very real way. I know sometimes it felt like it was us against everyone else, but honestly, it was just a small amount of people that were against this project and spreading rumors and I know it feels like it was the whole school but it honestly wasn't it was just a few silly rumors and it sucks how much that influenced the people around us and how it hurt the cast and crew but even despite of that I heard so many wonderful things from the cast and crew that they were saying about you about the production about how this was the easiest theater production they'd ever been in. It was the most calm. It was the most relaxed and least stressful because it was so accessible. And every time I heard that or someone said it to me, it made my heart soar. And I wanted to make sure that you knew that as well. This semester was a hot mess of stress and chaos. And it ended not the way that we thought it was going to. And it both really hurt us and everyone else there. For us, it made us both ill, pretty much. And I know I had to take an incomplete in one of my classes and I was sick and it was horrible, but even knowing all that, if I could go back in time, I would still do it all again. I would still join Curious Incident. I would still become co-director and I would still work with you in all the late hours that we put in because it was still one of the most valuable experiences I've ever had and I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade the relationships that I've made and the experiences I've gained for an easier semester, not by a long shot. I hope you know that there are people who love you and support you and feel the same as me would still do this again. Curious may not have gone up, but we did the show. We might not have performed in front of an audience, but we performed for each other. Our last rehearsal was the performance. That was it, we did it. It might not have been in front of people, but we proved that we could do it. And we faced, this project faced so much that if it wasn't this kind of production, if it wasn't set out from the beginning to change theater and show the ableism ingrained in these in kind of institutions, then we wouldn't have faced so much against us. We were set up to fail and I'm gonna say that we didn't fail. We got so far. Just because we didn't go up doesn't mean we failed. And it doesn't mean they won. It doesn't mean we lost. We did it. Curious Incident, in many ways, was a success. I know someday, someone somewhere will either have this idea on their own or will see your videos, see this documentary, 
and they will go, I want to do this. I want to learn from this. I want to learn from your videos. And I want to attempt this for myself. And maybe they'll be able to do what we couldn't. Maybe they will have broader support. Maybe they won't have as many blockades and they will be able to put up a show. And I think that will make this worth it. I want you to know that I love you and I care about you so much. And no matter what anyone says, we did it. Just for the record, if given the opportunity to do all of this over again with the same outcome that we had, I do it in a heartbeat.